each will do their presentation and then we'll put it up here and, and you can uh, and you can ask questions. So the first speaker is Mike Wayne from the University of Virginia. Uh, HBO quality television audiences and middle class taste cultures and exploratory empirical analysis. Thank you, sir. Content has created an opportunity to explore a variety of middle class taste cultures. Contemporary reception research addressing quality television, excuse me, quality television audiences rarely use social class as an axis of comparison. To build on previous audience reception research and expand the scholarly understanding of the relationship between more or less culturally legitimated text and social class, it is necessary to ask the following questions. What are the characteristics of middle class audience reception at the beginning of the post network era? How does the meaning of quality television vary with social status in middle class audiences? And how is the cultural capital associated with television understood by those who use it? To explore these issues, this preliminary research employs a qualitative methodology to examine the class ratified reception of HBO original content as it varies within the American middle class. The findings indicate the reception of HBO does indeed vary with status. Specifically, middle class audience members with higher levels of so socioeconomic status use an upper middle class understanding of leisure to explain their preferences, which coincidentally largely resemble critical judgment. In contrast, middle class audience members with lower levels of socioeconomic status employ a more general middle class framework through which preference operates on, a le on an individual level, rendering critical judgment largely irrelevant. At the level of text, quality television is distinguished by two factors, intertextuality and narrative complexity. According to Jonathan Gray, intertextuality is defined as the, quote, fundamental and inescapable interdependence of all textual meaning upon the structure of meaning proposed by other texts. Several scholars have noted that high levels of intertextuality are characteristic of HBO content. For example, David Lavery describes The Sopranos as, quote, the most referential show on television. Regarding Sex in the City, English scholar Deborah Germain claims the show achieves intertextuality through, quote, its continual evoking of film references, end quote. Quality television is also characterized by narrative complexity. According to Jason Mattel, narrative complexity refers to the emergence of a new mode of television storytelling. Unlike the traditional paradigm associated with procedural dramas, HBO content tends to be neither serial nor episodic. Regarding The Wire, Ted Mancelli has observed, that the show, quote, regularly refuses to offer viewers any sort of episodic narrative closure or even the promise that dangling questions will be answered in the next episode, end quote. Similarly, film scholar Dana Pollan claims The Sopranos refuses to offer, quote, narrative pleasures in simple form. If the texts associated with the label quality television are similar to other cultural products, then it's reasonable to expect the reception of such intertextual and narratively complex content will vary with socioeconomic status. The most common American middle class orientation of cultural products relies heavily upon an intellectual framework emphasizing the subjectivity of the individual. As Janice Radway describes in her investigation of literary culture, middle class taste is defined by a quote, middle ground personalism, unquote, which requires and supports a worldview in which taste is a reflection of individual idiosyncratic selves. Similarly, in addressing what he labels lower middle culture, sociologist Herbert Gans uh, notes the importance of subjectivity when explaining preference. In particular, he said the middle class orientation of cultural products values performers more than creators and individual judgment more than critical judgment. However, the American middle class is hardly monolithic. Research indicates that individuals with higher levels of socioeconomic status tend to have a different relationship with cultural products. For example, Michelle Lamont finds that upper middle class American figure men uh, value, quote, excuse me, value any, quote, kind of leisure activity that can be read as a signal of self actualization because it can be taken to indirectly signal high ranking on the moral, cultural, and socioeconomic status hierarchies. Similarly, uh, author, pundit, the New York Times, David Brooks, claims that a utilitarian approach to leisure is now dominant among the, quote, educated class. To 
examine the relationship between quality television and class stratified audience reception, a qualitative methodology was used to gather data from a snowball sample of 19 young adults. Participants were primarily recruited through word of mouth and were not compensated. Data collection occurred at a variety of physical locations depending on individual excuse me, availability and preference. Uh, although open-ended, each interview uh, typically began with a description of the respondent's childhood experiences with television and ended with a discussion of their contemporary preferences and habits. Interviews typically last between 60 and 90 minutes and were digitally recorded and transcribed. In addition, ethnographic field notes were taken after each interview. Uh, the sample is analytically divided between an individual respondent's socioeconomic status by using Richard Florida's distinction between creative and service class occupations as proxies for middle, excuse me, lower middle class and upper middle class status, respectively. Uh, I forgot the order on which I said, maybe not respectively. Uh, from that, it would be inappropriate to consider uh, this data as representative of these occupational groups in a statistical sense or definitive regarding post-network television audiences in a theoretical sense. Uh, all respondents have been given pseudonyms uh, in terms of age, all between 22 and 33 at the time of the interview. Nine were men, 10 were women, none identified as queer, all phenotypically white. Uh, in terms of access, all had internet access at home. 17 of 19 paid for cable television, 14 of 19 use a digital video recorder. In line with the theoretical expectations, uh, the data indicates that upper middle class reception of quote, quality television is characterized by dual tendencies. Attention to the creativity of cultural producers and the tendency to mirror, uh, mirror critical discourse regarding legitimated cultural texts. These tendencies commonly overlap when middle class young adults with high levels of socioeconomic status discuss what many critics believe to be the pinnacle of television achievement, the Sopranos. For example, Peter, a 25 year old intern working in international finance, casually misses knowledge of the series creator into his general praise of the show. He states, quote, Chase has done such a good job developing the characters there. Although praise is often heaped upon specific cultural producers, it is equally common for upper middle class young adults to describe the production process in more general terms. Uh, for example, immediately after praising David Chase, uh, Stephanie, a 26 year old first year associate at a Washington law firm, uh, shifts her praise to the Russian process overall. She says, quote, I mean, the thing I loved about this show was that I don't know if you realize this, but they actually had different writers for every episode, which is amazing because they managed to stay consistent when they actually had completely different writers." End quote. For both Peter and Stephanie, possessing the requisite knowledge needed to identify with content creators is closely related to the ability to mirror critical discourses regarding quality television. However, based on the preliminary data, it seems that this varies with gender. Uh, Broadly, upper middle class young men seem much more likely to use quality television to make status claims about themselves. Uh, as Lamont observed in the early 90s, American upper middle class men demonstrate self-actualization by developing expertise. For young men in contemporary upper middle class audience, uh, expertise is commonly demonstrated through individual level association with quality television producers. Uh, take Barry, for example. With a bachelor's degree from Ivy League University and a almost finished MBA, uh, he is certainly a member of the educational elite and has the job of a prominent pastry lobbyist and a scholar specializing in international development. He is also in the cultural elite. Uh, as such, Fair's thoughts about HBO's Dolly G Show uh, are instructive, uh, and its creator, Sasha Baron Cohen, in particular. He said, You know, it's funny. I watched this show and thought, Excuse me, I watched the show and thought the show was smart and funny. And then it was almost kind of like, I remember hearing it, and I was almost like, dude, get this. Not only is this funny, but he is just like us, you know? This guy went to Cambridge, and he's Jewish. And I was just like, wow, that makes this so much better. <laughs> In this context, knowledge about uh, the background of the show's creator serves as an important piece of cultural capital, as well as a source of personal identification. Although not Jewish himself, Barry, a phenotypically white Arab Christian with family in Lemon clearly identifies with Cohen's elite educational status and cultural status as a member of an ethnic minority. While potentially irrelevant to others, such details are extremely relevant to upper middle class audience members because of the associated claim regarding quality. For Barry, the ability to identify with a background television producer in these ways 
produces a particular kind of high quality that is necessarily associated with being, quote, just like us. In contrast, television taste does not seem to be a function of education for middle class young adults with less status. In the data, this is often reflected in such individuals' willingness to characterize the shows that they watch negatively. Grace, a 26-year-old uh, manager, bartender, with a college degree, uh, responded to a question about her preferences by stating, quote, I, re I am really into the worst TV shows. When asked a follow-up question, she said, I don't know what I think I find valuable. I don't know why I like them. I know that they are awful. Similarly, Ashley, a 26-year-old bartender who works at a posh DC uh, hotel, spent, who uh, didn't finish college, spent two years at Catholic University before uh, moving on, uh, moving on to repair, repay her debt. Excuse me. She explains, "I like Jersey Shore. I like trash TV, like Bravo. You know, the Kardashians, The Hills, The City." Regarding several E shows uh, later in the discussion, she adds. I watch a lot of that crap. In discussing HBO shows specifically, lower middle class young adults differ rather dramatically from their higher status peers. For example, when asked about Sex in the City, Grace recalls, I don't think I had HBO when Sex in the City was huge. I guess maybe I did because I was in college. Probably for the tail end of that, you know. A bunch of my friends were really into Sex in the City, so I think it, I caught it now and again. But it wasn't anything that I watched from start to finish or made a big deal out of the finale or anything. Thank you. Similarly, when asked about The Sopranos, Clark, a kitchen manager at an upscale restaurant who earned an associate's degree in motorsport engineering before changing career paths, offers his disapproval. He says, to be honest with you, I wasn't a real big Sopranos fan. I didn't even watch it. One of my friends made me sit with him every week, and he was all into it, and made me watch it every week, and I got a little into the story, and it was good, but it's just not my thing. Similarly, when asked if she ever watches anything on HBO, Ashley recalls, I did start to watch The Wire, more so because I'm from Baltimore, and I felt like obligated, but I couldn't get past the sixth episode. I thought it was so boring to start off with. Clearly, these individuals are unmoved by the critical acclaim associated with these texts. Uh, this is not to say, however, that middle-class young adults with less social status don't enjoy HBO content. Uh, for Grace, her favorite HBO show is True Blood. In explaining the show's appeal, she says, quote, it's like vamp porn, kind of. I mean, there's tons of sex, tons of violence. Yeah, it's gory and gross, with tons and tons and tons of super nude sex scenes all the time. However, as she continued, it became clear that her feelings about true blood are based on more than an appeal of sex and violence. She asserts, I don't want to watch anything to learn. I really don't watch TV all that often, unless I just bought a box set or something. Like, I'm trying to get into true blood, which I watched all three seasons, probably in the past three weeks. Uh, when describing the most appealing aspects of his favorite show, Treme, Clark says, quote, you don't leave, you just rebuild, you know? You make do and fix it, and rebuild and stay there, and keep the culture and the music and everything else that's down there. I mean, this is one of the heartbeats of music and culture that America has way beyond any other place around, you know? Here, Clark uses a moral framework privileging his middle-class work ethic to explain the emotional appeal of a particular text. In responding to a follow-up question, he elaborates, Trené was just a great exp expression of what New Orleans means to me and the rest of America. As Clark continues, however, it becomes clear that Trené's appeal has little to do with what New Orleans means for the rest of America. He explains, the story of New Orleans is a wonderful story, and I pride myself on being a Southern man, and that story just kind of speaks to me. Despite the invocation of a collective identity, preference remains at the level of the individual. And since these choices are Subjective, external opinion is largely irrelevant. Oh, I forgot that. Uh, excuse me. The presence of such taste hierarchies in the American middle class quality television audience is significant for three reasons. First, this data is indicative of the consequence associated with television's increasing cultural legitimacy as a medium. Uh, according to Newman and Levine, uh, this increase in legitimacy is not related to an overall qualitative improvement, but rather, they argue, that such increasing legitimacy is only possible with a sport of cultural elites who, quote, invest the medium with aesthetic and other prized values, nudging it closer to more established arts and cultural forms, preserving their own privileged status in return. And they are to continue to argue, television is now bifurcated. Contemporary niche targeted content 
is, quote, good because of association with the active masculine viewing experiences of elite audiences, while other content is, quote, bad because of its association with the passive feminized viewing experiences of mass audiences during the network era. Second, middle class discussions of HBO programming demonstrated the importance of quality varies with socioeconomic status. For upper middle class audience members, the ability to identify with producers of quality content is intimately bound up with the reception of HBO. In contrast, the quality associated with HBO content is largely irrelevant for middle class audience members with less status. The willingness to derive critically acclaimed content is not randomly distributed, and it seems the label quality is only relevant to those interested in making status claims through television. Third, most significantly, the data indicates that television could become a site of inequality like many other cultural, uh, culturally legitimated forms. Uh, from Newt Minow's vast wasteland to, uh, excuse me, from Newt Minow's vast wasteland to uh, contemporary characterizations such as the boob tube or the idiot box, television has commonly been considered a cultural product with limited intellectual appeal that panders to the lowest common denominator. But this research provides reason to believe this has started to change. In the context of a convergence culture, television is now another form of new media characterized by diversifying forms and contents. Specifically, technology, including digital video recorders, video on demand, and the internet, and industry changes resulting in the creation of niche content for premium networks such as HBO, now occupy an opportunity space in which elite understandings can gain legitimacy. Uh, if you want to see more about the paper, uh, MikeWayne.org, it is posted. Uh, thank you. the diverse approaches taken by two premium channels, HBO and Stars, to develop and market their respective sword and sandal epics, Rome and Spartacus, Blood and Sand. The distinctive nature of each channel's approach to the challenges of making its epic stand out in the vast TV landscape is revealing. Speaking to the demands of that landscape, the unique history and branding of each channel, and the singular nature of each epic itself. Both HBO and Stars take advantage of the relative freedom of cable, plus the distance provided by their epic's ancient settings, to provide their subscribers with eye-catching scenes of violence and explicit sexuality. However, the history, content, and marketing of Roman Spartacus provides an instructive contrast, which one could characterize succinctly as a distinction between prestige and pulp. Loaded with cultural, social, and economic import, the words prestige and pulp seem diametrically opposed, with prestige an alignment with what is valued and important, and pulp with what is trashy and discardable. A contrast between prestige and pulp has long been used to subjectively weigh cultural objects, posing high art to low, quality TV to trash TV. Considering this dichotomy, one can at first glance weigh HBO's Rome and Star Spartacus in this way, associating the former with prestige and the 
ladder with Pope on the basis of the, each program's respective narratives, pedigrees, and aesthetics, and the ways in which these are marketed to the public. Rome's pedigree is distinguished on multiple levels. HBO associates Rome, co-produced with England's BBC, with a sense of quality through the program's narrative. This narrative focuses on the political machinations of famous Romans such as Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, and Cicero, dramatizing Caesar's power grab and the murder and plotting of his heir Octavian and the fall of the Republic. This serves to tie the program to classical history, while the casting of British actors, respected for both stage and screen work, reinforces a sense that Rome is a serious intellectual exercise, even as the graphic violence and sex work to thrill and to titillate. Behind the camera, personnel are also key to the sense of quality associated with the production, from writer Bruno Heller, creator of CBS's The Mentalist, to respected directors, the most prominent being Michael Apted, renowned for films such as The Coal Miner's Daughter and Gorillas in the Mist, as well as the acclaimed documentary series Up, beginning with 1964's Seven Up. The story of Spartacus is also based on history, yet the program's focus on Spartacus's early, largely undocumented past as its gladiator, before his leadership of a slave rebellion against Rome, denies the program the same sense of history and spooling on screen that is afforded Rome. The program's use of largely unknown or cult actors, the former including the late Andy Whitfield as Spartacus, and the latter including Lucy Lawless, formerly of Xena, warrior princess fame, also lacks the high culture appeal of Rome's stage-trained actors, such as Lindsay Duncan and Karen Hines, familiar to American audiences through British-made dramas broadcast on PBS, think Masterpiece Theater and Mystery. Other key factors that influence this discourse of prestige and pulp include each channel's branding and budget levels, which affect the program's style and marketing. HBO's long history in the cable industry beginning in 1972 and its record of series that are both critically acclaimed and audience favorites, such as The Larry Sanders Show, Oz, Sex and the City, The Wire, as well as the awards Lady of the Sopranos, contrasts strongly with Star's more recent birth in 1994 and its relative paucity of critically acclaimed original programming. In its famous promo, launched in 1996, HBO proclaims, it's not TV, it's HBO, indicating that it is a creator of products in excellent taste, intended for the discerning viewer, who may spurn the majority of TV products, but who happily subscribes to HBO, or at least streams its products months later on Netflix. It is thus a premium channel, based not simply on economics, the extra cost of subscribers may pay beyond basic cable, but in its brand construction, with original programming such as Rome playing a key role in this construction. As Christopher Anderson notes in The Essential HBO Reader, by producing original programming, HBO has transformed itself from a movie channel that simply exhibited Hollywood features into a cultural phenomenon, one designed almost perfectly to solicit the attention and affections of an educated upper middle class. Stars lacks both HBO's vast subscriber base and international presence, and while it began to produce original programming in the 1990s, it had little significant critical or viewer success until Spartacus. Premiering in 2010, Spartacus's first episode set a record of 5,503,000 viewers on Stars, with another 460,000 on its sister channel Encore. The program maintained an average of 1.285 million viewers for the rest of the season, although these numbers are modest in comparison to Rome's numbers. Nielsen measurements indicate that 3.88 million people watch Rome's pilot, while the season two premiere gar garnered 7.5 million viewers. These numbers reflect HBO's extensive work to gain and hold viewers through constructing spectacular, yet character-centered programs, beautifully realized in every aspect of production and extensively promoted. HBO reputedly spent $100 million to produce the first season of Rome, and an additional $10 million to publicize it, using means such as cross-promotion with the History Channel to emphasize the program's engagement with classical history, and multi-page spreads in glossy popular magazines such as Vanity Fair and Entertainment Weekly to grab the attention of current and potential subscribers. Ads featuring a human dagger, excuse me, a human figure, figure clutching a dagger, standing on a blood-filled street lined with screen, with uh, ancient buildings, as we see here, cite the murder of Julius Caesar, familiar not only from history, but of course from 
Shakespeare's play, while the ominous of hate tagline every city has its secrets, foreground the importance of Rome, actual city and mythic ideal. The centrality of the city for the show's narrative and overall aesthetic is echoed in its promotion and press coverage, which detailed the program's shoot in Rome at the vast Cinecita studios and the information that the producers went to immense efforts to convey a sense of both the grit and grandeur of the ancient city through the use of vast sets, and here's an example from the Subura or Slum, scores of extras and authentically detailed costumes and props. While digital effects are used to create backgrounds in certain scenes, such as a scene view of a city from a villa or a clash of vast armies, digital effects are used relatively sparingly. And the aim, as the producers and crew members note, is to create a visceral, you are there, sense of this world. In contrast, STARS afforded the programmers of Spartacus a smaller budget, with the result that the producers depend largely on CGI rather than actual location shooting to create the program's world of gladiatorial matches and set its aesthetic style, indebted, as both the producers and critics have noted, to work such as Zack Snyder's 300, an adaptation of Frank Miller's graphic novel. This aesthetic is colorfully summed up by Robert Lloyd in his LA Times Review. Entitling its new series, Spartacus, Blood and Sand, the Stars Network cannot be accused of false advertising. There is blood, and lots of it, buckets of it, waves of it, seas of digitally enhanced candy apple red comic book gore, spilling, spurting, hurtling across the screen as bodies are stabbed slash sledgehammered and barely dismembered. There is sand too, but you don't notice that so much. Ads for Spartacus, thank you, uh, focus on the spectacular. In uh, this case, an attention, let me just pull this up a second. In this, in this case, an attention to the impressively muscled uh, body of its title character, dressed, or more correctly, half dressed, in his gladiator gear, posed solo or in conjunction with other key characters, including Lucy Lawless's Lucretia. The sight of the actress clad in a revealing dress, a significant source of come hither appeal for potential viewers. The differences in the branding and look of each production is reflected in the amount of awards each has received and the level of prestige of these awards. With Rome's multiple Emmy nominations and wins, a stark contrast to the lack of Emmy recognition for Spartacus. However, Kelsey Grammer's recent Emmy win as Best Actor for Star's new program, Boss, shows that Stars has begun to win major awards for its original programming. As I noted in my opening, the setting of the two programs, as well as their indulgence in graphic sex and violence, and here we have a sense here from Rome, the murder of Caesar, and uh, Antony and Cleopatra there, and here uh, on Spartacus. Uh, so this indulgence in graphic sex and violence may be similar, yet the diverse brand profiles of HBO and stars, as well as the different directions pursued in the marketing and overall look of each program, means that Rome and Spartacus can be read as significantly distant. Distinct. However, I want in closing to complicate this reading, noting that a dichotomy of prestige versus pulp ignores the manner in which most TV programs contain elements of both, forming a distinctly hybrid appeal to viewers, even as producers, critics, and audience members may simult simultaneously foreground one or the other in order to differentiate one show from another or one channel. Thus, while Spartacus may indeed uh, utilize visual spectacle in a more obvious or artificial manner than Rome, it weds its explicit eroticism and violence to complex characterization and narrative structure in a, in a manner very similar to Rome. So too, Rome may indeed but be linked to the works of Cicero and Shakespeare, but it's also, and very openly, a bloody, sexy spectacle. As a friend, Medievalist, frankly noted when I told him I had ordered Rome on Netflix for my summer viewing, pleasure, he said, enjoy the historical. Thank you. All right, and if we have time, just a moment, do you think we have time for yes, just a please. short clip from each, just to yeah. take a look and see how um, each station was um, promoting these, and I'm not sure where we are as far as volume or anything like that, so I'm gonna give it a try, and uh, be gentle with me if this doesn't get yeah. run.
of madmen. Align yourself with us and we'll step through and wither away. You cannot stay. I can do as I wish. The tide turns already. You will never see us but now. The gods will abandon Rome. I want him dead. And that you shall have. We'll hear him off. I'm tight as pull-up. These bloody men might give it to you. When do you take five hour energy? When I'm on the map.
Jersey Shore look like to call that television. Um, and, and I'm seeing precisely the same sorts of things uh, going on in uh, a vast array of television quality and non-quality, uh, and as well as uh, various types of film, from sexploitation films to art cinema to contemporary Hollywood romances. So I won't be talking about all of that today. In fact, I will be talking mostly about um, quality television today, so it will fit in some sense. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Upon its debut in 2004, the L Word was hailed as a game-changing instance of queer women gaining media visibility and voice, created as it was primarily by, for, and about queer women. Before long, the series was criticized for constructing a narrow range of representations focused predominantly on white, economically unchallenged, gender-conforming, mostly femme, lesbian-identified women. While these criticisms focused on what the show left out, even more egregious to this viewer at least, was the initial inclusion and endorsement followed sharply by the vehement disavowal of bisexually identified lead Alice Piazeki, played by Lisha Haley, who goes from proudly proclaiming her bisexuality in the pilot episode and throughout season one to admitting that bisexuality is gross, that's her direct quote, in season three, to dating women exclusively and not once uttering the B word for the next three seasons. All right, so here's just one short clip from the very first episode. Oh my god, you would never know it by the way he fucks. Oh, Christ, Alice. What are you going to make up your mind between dick and pussy? And spare us the glory of our sexual details, please. Well, for your information, Dana, I'm looking for the same qualities in a man as I am in a woman. Big tits. Dramas to introduce female same-sex couples, 
This potential for bisexual story arcs and character development has in practice been stymied by the predilection of TV characters to undergo radical personality transformations as quickly as from one episode to the next. As in the case of Nighttime Teen Soap, the OC, in which the second season romance between two femme young women lasted a mere four episodes and once concluded, appears not to have caused series regular Marissa, played by Nisha Barton, another thought. Despite its flaws, the l -word model for English language television, what Anna McCarthy calls, quote, everyday queerness, end quote, integrating recurring queer characters and non-interrupted storylines without necessarily applying identity labels or normalizing queerness into something apolitically palatable. This, alongside the expanding capacity of 21st century television to encourage narrative complexity, mature content, niche viewership, and fan communities, engender ways of seeing beyond compulsory monosexuality, and counters bisexuality's elision in our cultural logic of desire and its representations. Where the default status quo structure of episodic television and the contained temporality of feature films created pressure to resolve questions of sexuality, the narrative open-endedness and expanded time frame that characterize serial television drama offer a particularly promising site for mounting long-range and multifaceted explorations into bisexual character identities and experiences. Serial narrative encourages bisexual representation by permitting it to unfold over time, necessary for the accumulation of experiences that renders bisexuality not theoretically or practically viable for any individual is potentially bisexual, no matter his or her behaviors to date, but rather representationally legible. Given this rich, though rarely realized, potential of serial television's extended narrative format to create spaces for representing sexual fluidity, the question becomes, to what degree do such representations in contemporary English language television drama escape the constraints of bisexual disavowal and compulsory non-sexuality? One way in which contemporary bisexuality in television and film representation has stayed the same is by remaining largely the province of film women. Yet some degree of evolution is noticeable. A multi-episode romance between an exotic dancer played by Julie Benz and a middle-aged divorcee played by Dana Delaney on ABC's Desperate Housewives might at first glance glance seem a typical instance of short-term sensationalized sweet bisexuality. It appeared in the series lag Lagging Sixth Season, featured a lusciously styled femme in the role of sexually ambiguous temptress Robin Gallagher, and lasted only five episodes. Thus it is a surprise when the relationship between Robin and the newly single Catherine Mayfair, Delaney's character, is treated with a maturity and sincerity that runs counter to the show's trademark campiness, even if Catherine's full disclosure to her girlfriends on Mysteria Lane results immediately in the storyline's ending. Catherine and Robin ostensibly off to enjoy a new life elsewhere, and Delaney and Ben's summarily gone from the cast roster. Admittedly, they had both gotten roles in pilots that were picked up. Also on ABC, though, it resuscitated its leading bisexual temptress character as late as 2009 in the person of Dr. Sadie Harris, played by Mer Melissa George. Grey's Anatomy has gone on to maintain a sexually fluid identity of Dr. Callie Torres, played by Sarah Ramirez who has relationships with men and women before marrying her female partner, Dr. Arizona Robbins, played by Jessica Capshaw, and co-parenting the child she conceived with her long-term, non-platonic male friend, Dr. Mark Sloan, played by Eric Day. Though the homonormative slant of the segue into married monogamy should not theoretically delimit Callie's bisexuality, it seems doubtful that there will be much occasion for its development now that she is effectively de-eroticized, given the show's conservatively rendered depiction of Callie and Arizona's relationship as strictly monogamous and sexually chaste. Olivia Wilde, who played Alex, object of Marissa's momentary affections on the OC, went on to play secretive bisexual Dr. Remy 13 Hadley on House MD, though seemingly with the stipulation that she not act on her same-sex desire, except in her occasional self-destructive drug-fueled one-night stands, prompted by her difficulty in accepting that she has a fatal disease. When Wilde leaves the show at the end of season eight, it is in the arms of her character's girlfriend, notable for disrupting, disrupting the presumption that bisexuals end up with men, while also leaving 13's bisexuality unquestioned, even if said girlfriend neither warrants a name nor a single line of dialogue. Younger aged characters may be less readable as bisexual given their limited sexual experience and more intense pressure to conform socially, but more bi-suggested in other ways. In the British series Sugar Rush, in falling enthralling bad girl sugars, adolescent impetuousness, and exhibitionism make for torturous mixed signals for her crushing best friend, yet put bisexual behavior consistently and unabashedly on display. Although BBC series Lip Service could hardly deny its debt to the L word, which is particularly evident in the visual and narrative mirroring between the two shows Soft Butch, Lady Killers, Shane, and Frankie, the 
the British show's first season exhibits as much potential willingness to go beyond homosexuality as did the initial season of The L Word. When an intoxicated Frankie spontaneously sleeps with a male mate, neither she nor the show's other queer female leads respond as if there's been a lesbian security breach. That Frankie, figured as the longest term lesbian and certainly the least gender conforming among the show's leads, occasionally exhibits bisexual behavior, suggests a fluidity and lack of judgment about identity far from the policing that characterized later seasons of The L Word. The sexually ambiguous woman constitutes a new form of having it both ways and being a recurring character whose sexuality remains perennially unresolved while providing an erotic, exotic thrill and erotic solution in every episode. Kalinda Sharma, Archie Punjabi, the Indian American investigator on The Good Wife, is just such a bisexually behaving femme with potent powers of seduction. While Kalinda's serially single status allows for greater bisexual explicitness in giving her multiple opportunities for sexual partners, male and female, it also frames her every encounter as a transactional exchange for information, devoted as she is to her career, making Kalinda a bisexual mercenary for whom power and pleasure are conflated within a covetous logic of desire. The Good Wife's third and most recent season, however, suggests that Kalinda finds sex with women appealing in a way that is not reducible to fruitful disclosure. It's not gonna work. Life's not gonna work. Seducing you? I don't wanna seduce you. You don't? No. Too easy. Hey. What's the point anyway? I don't get it. Without a penis involved? It's like baseball without a bat. Well, you get it when you get it. Oh, deep. It's different. A woman's lips and... When you get a woman excited... It's not like a man. I hope not. It's not aggressive. It's slow. Okay. Uh, they're leaning on a predictably binary ordering of sexual experience on the basis of gendered object choice and gender stereotypes. Kalinda's musings imply her rules to attraction, of her rules of attraction to women at least, are predicated on more than just professional considerations. She give us both a card. It doesn't make any sense. Obviously, she's bisexual. I can hate that. What is that? What is that anyway? Huh? I mean, pick a side already, right? Absolutely. Can't you make up your mind? What is this? They have to have sex with everyone? They have to do everything? Half the population isn't enough for them? Well, they yeah. want everybody so selfish? You can't believe it. She did not seem the type to me. What are we gonna do? I don't know. I guess we'll just have to back away because, you know, most of these women who say they're bi, they're really gay and they just can't say it. Back away? You back away? Yeah, I think you should. Well, why, why would I back away? It's all who's crazy about me. I don't believe you. You okay? don't believe because me? Because I felt it. My body felt it, okay? I came alive in areas that have been dry like the Sahara Desert. Uh, you follow me, Larry? Well, in baseball, the tie goes to the run. In situations like this, tie goes to the head run. It was no tie, babe. She hit my base first. Cleanly before she even saw you. You're intent on going through this? Of course I am. I don't want you to get hurt, Larry. You've been through a lot, right? A lot of other women here. Probably women who, the more your speed, the more your level. Spare yourself the expense and embarrassment. Get out of this now. Okay, save myself. Yes, because you're going to be annihilated. I'm going to be annihilated by you in the love department? Well, we'll just see what happens. Game on, Larry David. You got it, sister. All right. Good luck to you. You're in over your head, Rosie. You think so? I know so. She's a dyke. Deal with it. Enthusiasm primarily targets. 
Despite reassurance from a male buddy that having a penis gives him the edge, Larry becomes increasingly concerned that lesbians have an advantage with women because guys don't know what they're doing down there. That's a direct quote from Larry. The bisexual episode refreshingly undermines the presumed phallic preference on the part of women and offers the bisexually identified character a final affirmative acknowledgement when Larry, overjoyed that his date like baseball, explains that dating a bisexual is like being with a great guy that happens to have a vagina. Yet, like so many of television's bisexual characters, Jane Cohn is never to reappear. In, whoa, one minute, okay. I'm gonna skip ahead and I can take questions or make comments about rescue me in the Q&A and I will read my last paragraph. The romantic strain of bisexual suggestiveness in rescue me and so much recent Hollywood cinema can be seen across contemporary television from MTV's 2008 reality style series Bromance, a spin-off of its more popular The Hills, to the much noted affection evident between Gregory House and uh, James Wilson, Hugh Laurie, and Robert Sean Leonard on House MD, and between Alan Shore, James Spader, and Zinni Crane, and William Shatner on Boston Legal. That these shows of male affection are named physically chaste seems symptomatic of a broader cultural trend whereby increased homosexual visibility results in greater policing of homosociality. Television's most distinctive by suggested male may be Captain Jer Jack Harkness, John Barrowman, as a sexually fluid time traveler on Doctor Who's spin off Torchwood, in which temporal transportation, transportation and uh, character metamorphosis liberate the social subject to a superhuman degree, even if it remains the stuff of science fiction. So, in closing, while this line from Glee invites us to regard non monosexual identities with a skeptical, stigmatization that we have seen time and time again, Santana's dismissal of her BFF with benefits, Brittany Heather Morris, is noted, noteworthy both for sounding the other F words, suggesting it to be a term in common usage among the teens that Glee primarily depicts and targets, and for the behavior it criticizes. But it is also a line that suggests there to be a certain breaking point when it comes to bisexual representability, whatever the medium and whoever the target audience. Through the long gestation of this project, which has just culminated in a book, uh, I have seen bisexuality's screen visibility refined and its nameability increased, though its discursive depth remains boundary. As a fluid identity position identifiable across an expanse of shows and films, the B word is still deployed for better and for worse. Thank you.
cinema, you know, the, the kind of willingness to not nail things down in a resolved way or to make characters more ambiguous um, uh, is accommodating of bisexuality, but so is the romance because it's reacting to a certain uh, comfort with uh, and, and, you know, uh, fascination with uh, homosexuality and homoeroticism in our culture. So it's happening across the board, it's just happening in distinct ways, essentially. Both prestige and pulp have like their bisexuality.
I'm, I'm, I'm above regular television, and, and, and uh, it's been established over and over again with the, uh, uh, the Nielsen's that, that people will lie and say oh, I was so watching PBS when I was you know, really watching it. Where they stop lying is when they relate to the producers in very specific ways. They can't, I, I don't think anybody could lie about that. Mm -hmm. I require such an engagement with the text. Mm -hmm. To pull out, with the, you know, not just with the text, but you can't learn about Tasha Baron Cohen's background from watching the Ology Show. You have to do extra work mm -hmm. to develop that kind of knowledge, uh, and then much less apply it and say, "Oh, it's so great, it's just like us." Mm -hmm. Even goes beyond the extra step. It is that's a status point. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned also the sort of alternate discourse of guilty pleasures. Could you, could you say a little bit more about how that fits in? High end people don't like to think about themselves in such a way. Uh, they would prefer to think of everything as intellectually engaging. Uh, and some of this, I'm sure, has to do with the fact that people in creative class occupations don't stand on their feet all day, don't, you know, they're not physically exhausted after a day of work uh, in the same way that particularly the people who work in the service industry, but they get home and they want to relax. They're not, the attempt to engage with uh, hyper intellectual content. I don't know if that doesn't apply. They would say, I might like that, but not when I get home from work and I'm exhausted. I would enjoy that in a different kind of context. Uh, but is some of that you also mentioned it possibly being generational? I'm just thinking about. You know, these are all young people, uh, very young. I mean, is it then possibly about the context of the way that things, what you were getting about, the way the question you're asked? I'm thinking about how, you know, when I ask my students what their favorite and most hated programs are at the beginning of the semester, and once they realize it's discourse is class, uh, and I don't really know why. Uh, maybe part of it is the utilitarian approach to leisure. Leisure is not, leisure is an opportunity to improve oneself uh, in whatever form that means. It may be also a gender connection. Oh, sure. Women are more likely to confess to a guilty pleasure. Uh, interestingly, it, this preliminary research, women seem to be kind of making status claims in a relational context more often. I watch this with my boyfriend and we share the enjoyment of this together. Uh, and I don't want to overdraw the implication of gender, but I don't know, Carol Gilligan, uh, the mm -hmm. dismissed psychological work. If, if that's true, that could I could be seeing that in the data, but I'll have to do more mm -hmm. to find out. Uh, thank you for the question. Naturally related, uh, or lack thereof, not 
said much about sexual fluidity, alternative sexualities, non-monogamy, polyamory of all sorts. You know, um, it's it's about anything that's non-binary rather than about bisexuality specifically. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question about that? Mm -hmm. I, I found it particularly interesting that you noted that the fluid sexuality was represented kind of most effectively in Grey's Anatomy, mm -hmm. uh, or as the best. I mean. Oh, and another woman of color. That strikes me as very counterintuitive. Uh, why would you know, it strikes me as more likely to see a more realistic uh, depiction on HBO rather than ABC? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how that could be, why that might. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, again, even though I'm calling Kelly Torres a bisexually behaving character, you know, she never actually uses the B word herself as much mm -hmm. as I can recall, or if she does, it's only to kind of disavow it as a, an identifier for herself. Um, so I think that's one way that the, uh, the show had of kind of skirting, uh, seeming to be too um, not kind of vocal or, or visible uh, in its bisexual representation. But that said, I mean, it, it I think lends again um, way to my findings that this transcends the prestige and pulp types of boundaries. That um, I don't think Hallie's ongoing refusal to be binarily, you know, monosexually um, restricted uh, is something that we see on the outward. And, and so it's, you know, it is counterintuitive. And yet, um, why do we have that assumption that, you know, the, <laughs> the um, quality television of HBO is any more highly evolved in sexual politics than uh, network television? Um, it's been an interesting discovery. And somebody who's not presented as an exotic in the way that Kalinda and other women of color are in terms of their sexual fluidity and otherwise. Um, since you have to skip over a Q and <laughs> could you now talk a little bit about it? Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, what was so fascinating to me initially about Rescue Me is that it was a male bisexual and not a one-off character. Um, you know, it's so confined to femaleness and it's um, so confined to the kind of one-off characters. That to find a recurring character who's part of the lead ensemble um, on a show that is broadcast as one of the kind of shows to herald this working man, uh, you know, cock swinging and ball busting type of show on FX. Um, it was just so noteworthy, you know, and, and so it just caught my attention for that regard. Now, Rescue Me is a complicated case because it operates in a highly ironic register. Um, unlike pretty much any of the other shows, except for your enthusiasm that I talked about today. Um, so on the one hand, that's kind of a quality television trope. But on the other hand, it makes it really tough to kind of finagle a reading of how progressive it is about its sexual politics. Um, it appeared to give a lot of uh, visibility to the bisexual character, um, and he wasn't thrown off the show at the end of that character arc, or that story arc, rather. And uh, yet he's the kind of laughing stock character on the show, he's the butt of a lot of jokes. He's the queer-like character that can kind of prove, that can shore up you know, the heteromasculinity of all the others. Um, and you know, he suffers for and is punished for, you know, in this very kind of melodramatic way, his bisexual forays. Um, you know, he's kind of physically, he's literally incapacitated on crutches for an entire season, and he's uh, figuratively incapacitated as well. But he does get to come back into the fold after renouncing his bisexuality when things get too polyamorous and too sexually fluid in his um, story arc. And the reason he's able to do that is because, and this reverts back to really early um, dynamics around queer representation, he was the, um, uh, he was only the uh, active partner, not the passive partner. So uh, he never, actually gave a blowjob, he only received one, to put it in very literal terms, and that gave him a kind of figurative virginity that, um, without which he probably wouldn't have been able to remain on the show. I mean, it really gets into those kinds of, um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, well, yeah, obviously what they are. It's not a progressive <laughs> show in terms of sexual politics, so it's a regressive show, so it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, okay, and I have a, a question for Brennan, just wondering, um, do you, um, have you looked at any fan sites for the two shows for Romans Vargas? 
I've looked at some viewer comments, but I haven't really spent time on the fan side. So yeah. I'm just wondering if there's some crossover between mm -hmm. these two, you know, where they, they self-identify mm -hmm. in one camp or another. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've read a lot of um, sort of viewer comments where they've said, I like Rome, but Spartacus is kind of Rome plus, you know, uh -huh. that it's more sex, more violence. And, and, some, and some viewers um, feel, you know, who are kind of aligning themselves more with prestige, mm -hmm. they feel that, that that's too much for them, that they feel that that's sort of X that plus is like, no. And other people say, this is wonderful. You know, I, I was a history buff, I loved Rome, but this is, this really, really draws my attention. Wow, and, and then, pause a minute, is, is um, are, do you think that the producers, or, or I haven't seen the marketing beyond the trailers that you, mm -hmm. that you showed, um, is the, are the shows marketed with, with a, the different, the different what, class aims in mind? Do, oh, do you, do you, you mean class thinking class about class? the different kind of ideas of prestige and yes, in each yes. of the ads? Um, I haven't noticed so, you know, kind of a differentiation mm -hmm. within the ads themselves. I, I would need to go back and look more thoroughly to see. And certainly the looks of the two shows are, are you know, comic book. Right. While they're getting yeah. 
you, you, you've got the money on screen, but you're absolutely right. What brings us back is the hook. It's the serial soap opera hook that's, you know, it's the candy in the midst of the, the beautiful red apple. You well, know. I'm focus on family melodrama that I remember thinking right. about. So Amanda Rhodes wrote yeah. a piece about Sons of Anarchy in Antenna that addresses exactly these issues, which is that even though if they're gangsters and they're riding motorcycles, underneath it's all about who knows what and when and how are people playing one. Well <laughs> uh, yeah. So even in you know, hyper-masculine things, it's all kind of Soviet in a mm -hmm. 